Greetings, bird nerds. Welcome from Wurundjeri country, Melbourne, Australia, or in the indigenous parlance, Nam. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. Today we're talking bird feeding, feeding birds, following on from a couple of discussions we've done with the Birds in Backyards leader, Holly Parsons. Today we're on the other side of the world. We're talking with Tammy Poppy, who for 25 years has been placing a bird feeder in her backyard and taking careful note of what she's seeing. Um, welcome, Tammy. Thanks for Thank joining you. the Bird Emergency. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, you're situated in Wisconsin. So let's place Wisconsin for those who are not in the States, not... Um, you know, the 197 other countries in the world that uh, are not obsessed with the states of the US. Um, Wisconsin sits on the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes is in the northeast quadrant of America, bordering Canada. Right. So that's it. And Wisconsin is the most westerly of the states that border any of the Great Lakes. Have I got that right? I believe so. I, I, I'm trying to think if Minnesota borders a Great Lake, but I don't think it does. Yeah, if it does, well, it would be superior. But yeah, you're 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 spot on. Okay. So so we're so we're inland of the New York and the New England bit, but mm -hmm. we haven't right quite hit the Midwest. So we're so we're in that in that little corner. So that's where we are. Tammy, 25 years you've been putting a bird feeder out in your in your yard. Have you been in the same actual yard, the same house for 25 years? No, no, actually. Um, oh, it's been two yards, so it's it's not that far off. Um, but uh, yeah, so started in southeast Wisconsin in another town not too far from where I am now, and. Um, yeah, this would this would be the second home and same general vicinity, different county, but the same kind of birds, still seeing the same kind of birds. So tell me what what constitutes a first timer's bird feeder in in the US. And and let's note we'll we'll talk about it a bit more uh, as we get into it, but your slap bang on that north south flyway that 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 goes through the US so you're going to see a range of birds over the over the year but when you first started out um what was the kind of feeder you put out um how did you how did you get started yeah actually it was by accident um I was newly married and my husband gave me a, a bird feeder set up for Christmas. Um, and I was like, oh, awesome. This is pretty cool. Um, it was a fancy uh, bird feeder pole with the various hooks and whatnot. Um, and then a bird feeder, a hopper style feeder that just sat on the top of the bird feeder pole itself. Um, of course, he didn't include any food in there. So we managed to, <laughs> <laughs> we managed to set it up and put out, put it outside. Um, I had no idea what was going to show up. You know, um, I went to the store and basically what was recommended to me was black oil sunflower seed, which even now today, there's just, you can really attract a huge variety with just that one seed. Um, so poured that in and waited and waited um, it took a few days, but pretty quickly they started to come and I had no idea what they were. <laughs> so that that's one of the, the, I think the, I mean, we're talking your, your journey started 25 years ago with, uh, with recognizing birds, but I think the only plus that I can draw out of the pandemic and the, the time spent in lockdown and over here, we spent a lot of time in lockdown, <laughs> was that people started to really notice the the wild creatures uh, around us and started to, you know, lo love their local area. So 
did you did you uh, rush out and grab a bird book? Did you already have like a, a set of binoculars because you're up near the lakes? Maybe you you were watching boats or something up up there. How did how did you get into that um, the the mindset of really noticing that the birds were different and then mm -hmm. checking out what they were? Yeah, it was actually pretty gradual. Um, like I said, it, it took a little bit, a few days for them to start coming. Um, and when they did appear, I started noticing they were, looked different, right? Hello, there's different species of birds. Uh, something I never, never once pondered before. Um, honestly, didn't really, didn't really care, gave it no thought. But yeah, I ran out and got a Wisconsin bird guide and started flipping through the book and identifying what was at my feeder. So yeah, it was more or less out of curiosity. Um, and at that time it was purely, this is a cool bird. What is it? You know, it wasn't, um, digging in and understanding more about the species and, um, most likely if it was really pretty, it was a male of course, and finding out what the female would look like that didn't really enter my mind initially. So it was kind of a gradual process where I just, you know, fell in love with birding and nature in general. Did you start to to list them down? Did you start keeping a notebook or did you, you know, put ticks in <laughs> in, in your guide? No. Did, so to you... this to this day I don't do that. I uh, um I don't want to say I don't care, but I guess I, I, I don't, I'm too into enjoying them. Sounds yeah. kind of hokey, I but. I totally get it. I don't, I don't have a list, but I, but I, do, when I go through the bird books, I will go, yep, that one, yep, that one, yep, mm -hmm. that one. But I don't, I don't list them and I, I let the side down. I don't, um, I don't habitually enter my sightings or anything into any of the community databases, which. I know I should do. I know. Um, uh, do, do, you have, do you have a pang of guilt about that? I certainly Not do. Not until you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do. Um, I, uh, I do a, a thing each morning, Tammy, where I, um, and because it's early morning, I would usually be doing it now. So sorry to anyone who is waiting for my hashtag first seen and heard report this morning. <laughs> Me too. I'm um, sorry. Take you away yeah. from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's plenty of time uh, afterwards. I'll just I'll just be late. Hopefully, someone gets in first. Um, do, do, is it a big thing uh, locally and with you know you're you're a, a casual observer, even though you're a very committed feeder. Mm -hmm. From you know the people I generally talk to are really invested in in birds and what they see and, mm -hmm. um actually let's let's explore that are yeah. you invested are you invested in your birds i am but i can tear myself away um i know uh, uh, much of my audience is very um what's the word i mean while i have passion for the birds i know they'll be okay if i go on vacation <laughs> And no one's putting the seed out, um, you know, especially in the summer, summertime. But it, yeah, I just, I just love, I, I just enjoy learning about them. Um, I don't get too crazy about it. I just, you know, and I've often wanted to get involved in bird photography. And the problem I find is I just get too distracted just watching them and enjoying them. You know, I'm not setting up my camera and I'm just not getting ready. And I'm like, okay, I need two different times to observe the birds. Just one enjoyment, just kicking back and enjoying them. Um, and the other one is to really be focused and uh, ready to snap pictures because you can't do both. I, I haven't figured out a way to do it. Yeah, it's... Um... I, I suffer from that same uh, melody that you... Um... You just get too interested in watching what what a bird does. I mean, I, I, I I'm loving uh, a, a a local European blackbird here that's waking me up every morning at about four o'clock, and and I can't get 
a different first herd bird into my report <laughs> because he's so. Uh, but the the other day he he just went nonstop for about seventeen hours. I mean, amazing stamina! Wow! Um, introduced invasive species, um, forced out all of our local birds in in that niche. But I can't help but like him because he's so. Uh, I mean, anthropomorphizing the birds. I think he's a very committed <laughs> character, but um, there's a lot of blackbirds around my place. It's a hard job, I think, to maintain a territory, and and my my little place must be slap bang in the middle of a of a good one, or right on the edge of a good one. I don't know why he's singing in my tree all the time. Yeah, trying uh, to keep the others away. Yeah, and uh, when I when I do my walk route, I see. You know, thirty. I reckon about thirty male blackbirds, and there are pitch battles all over the place. So hmm. But birds are birds are great to watch. So how? I don't know how. Well, I admire those people who can be very technical, looking through a lens, um, at the same time as taking note of what the birds are doing and trying to to understand it. I yeah, I would to... imagine it's a it's a learned skill, you know, something that you develop over time. Yeah, definitely. I think it's habituated for sure. Uh, Tammy, what what did you begin feeding the birds? You you mentioned seed and and black sunflower seed, but mm-hmm. has that evolved over time? And in mm-hmm. and is there a a discussion amongst the bird feeding community and the the garden bird watching community over there about what you should feed <laughs> well like i mentioned i started out with black oil sunflower seed because that's all i knew and that's what was recommended to me at the local store um but yeah over the years you start to learn um what kind of birds it attracts and maybe you don't want the certain kinds of birds that are attracted to it. And so you start to switch to different types of seed. Um, So for example, in the past few years, I've switched to safflower seed because not only do Northern Cardinals love it, which one of my most favorite birds is the Northern Cardinal, um, but uh, house sparrows do not care for it as much. Although I've heard other people say, yeah, they still eat the safflower seed. but in my yard, they do not. So um, I prefer, you know, I prefer to attract certain kinds and distract or detract. Um, discourage. Not a, discourage other other types of species. Um, and squirrels don't like safflower seed either. So if that's, you know, something that I personally don't have an issue with squirrels. I have a really cool baffle on my feeder pole, so I don't have that issue. Um, but then also... You know, when I know the Orioles are migrating through in the spring, I'll put oranges out. Um, and of course, who doesn't love hummingbirds? So I'll have nectar out all the time um, throughout summer. Um, so so you, you've brought up the different seasons. Um, do you notice a lot of change um, from... You know, what one half of the year to the other um, I, I want to talk specifically about the migration period in a in a minute but but is summer and and winter are you changing the feed are you uh, suet balls anything like that are you at, giving the winter birds extra treats um, yeah we- yeah I do definitely in the winter I do put out a uh, mostly suet. Uh, my, my favorite type of feeder is the platform feeder um, because you can throw anything on it. You know, you can throw mealworms on it or any type of seed, even, even thistle if you want, um, chunks of suet, whatever. So that's my favorite type of feeder through winter because I get to see a different variety that come to the feeder. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't feed a lot in the summer. I just don't. I know the birds are, you know, they're nesting. Um, They're looking for insects to feed the babies and they're, they're just, they're not hanging around the yard that often. Um, So I just don't, I just don't put it out other than the nectar. I always have that out. Um, And winter, like I said, is mostly suet. 
Um, and a variety of other seeds that, you know, I'll just go out and throw a handful of different stuff, nuts, peanuts. Um, they really like here. Yeah. I think, you know, high fat, high protein foods are good for the winter because those poor things just burn so much energy, just, you know, just trying to stay warm. So try to help them out a little bit. Who are the, who are the regular winter, winter visitors to your, uh, yard? And, and what, what are the highlights for you in winter? Uh, the, the regulars would be blue jays, of course, uh, Northern Cardinals, um, nuthatches, um, woodpeckers. Um, there's a, there's a pair of pileated woodpeckers, as a matter of fact, in our neighborhood. So it's a real thrill to see them. They, they haven't come to my yard bet yard yet but they're pretty cool um let's see hairy woodpeckers downies especially um have yeah. you got my favorite my favorite named bird the yellow-bellied sap sucker <laughs> i have not seen one i i don't know i don't know if they're even in our range to be honest with you yeah they might be a bit further west more of a dry yeah a little further sea. south for their year round yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and in in the summertime, uh, you you mentioned hum, hummingbirds. We'll talk we'll talk about hummingbirds specifically in a minute. But um, are most of your summertime birds um, residents as well? Do they stick around for the year, or is it the migrating birds that you see in the summer? Uh, most of what I just uh, mentioned are year-round birds in our area. Um, let's see. Robins, robins will, some of them will migrate, some will stick around, um, but we see a lot of those in the summertime. Uh, let's see. Morning doves, of course, um, year round, we'll see them. There's a couple that will um, come visit us for the, for the winter, just for the winter. Actually, uh, the dark-eyed juncos, those are the sweetest little bird, one of my favorite winter birds. Um, they're actually, year round, they're up north, uh, northern wisconsin even they make their way down south uh for the winter uh pine siskins i think also come visit for the winter so that's kind of interesting i mean our winters are pretty brutal so it's kind of crazy to think a bird would actually come here just for winter um but they do do you get my my favorite american bird the prothonotary warbler in in your range no no i uh, no I've heard of it, but we don't get that around here. We don't get many warblers, to be honest with you, um, in this neck of the woods. So there, there's a good point. What What's the natural habitat um, surrounding you consist of? Is it sort of pine forest in your area or is it a, a, a more a, a woodland forest? Yes, it's a mix of all of those, actually. Um, I live in a subdivision, so, you know, our yard is, you know, we have the lawn, it's carved out yeah. um, around the house. But um, just to the north of us, there's an open area that is fully wooded and deciduous, uh, pine trees, all sorts of stuff in there. Um, and I frequently hear woodpeckers in there that I don't see in my yard. So I know there's birds in the area that uh, don't prefer my particular habitat. It's more open here. Um, but then we also have uh, the Kettle Marine National Forest around us, you know, surrounding our cities and whatnot. So uh, it's pretty much a variety. We even have lowland areas. So the swamp loving birds. Um, yeah, we have a huge variety of different habitats. Before we start talking about your yard, let's talk about the migrating birds. Um, how much of a of a variation in the visitors to your feeder do you get between your your resident summer and winter birds, and what comes through in the mm -hmm. uh, biannual migration? Yeah. Um... I honestly don't see a lot of variation at my feeder with the exception of the Baltimore Orioles in the spring. 
I try to catch them coming back, but they've never stopped. Um, indigo buntings in the spring. Um, uh, if I'm being honest, the only thing I notice in the fall coming through here is uh, starlings, you know, coming through in their giant flocks and swirling around. I forget the name for that particular. Yeah, that phenomenon, which is yeah. the first time I saw it, I was like, what the? I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on out there. But um, I know it's not everybody's favorite bird, but wow, it looked cool. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that that's astounding how they um, cooperate and synchronize so they're not smashing into each other and dropping out of the sky um, <laughs> right yeah. and some of those you know in clouds of starlings you know pe people have estimated that there's a million birds in 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 one you know wow uh staggering to the the way they coordinate their movement um, just amazing yeah again sometimes you can you can love the birds that you grew up to hate <laughs> so <laughs> Although every, every bird's a good bird, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even though we don't want them in our yard necessarily. No, and certainly not in your eaves or your um, uh, any crevices in in your buildings. <laughs> right. Um, Tammy, hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the pattern of seeing them? How often and what type are you getting in your that you've noticed at your feeders? Yeah, in this range, we only have one type, the ruby-throated. Um, but I, every time I see them, I, it's like the cardinal. It, you just never get tired of seeing them. Um, and I have a nectar feeder that I have hanging from my kitchen window. So, you know, early evening, I'll see them come in, or one. I don't, I don't get hordes of them, which is fine. I, I don't really want them uh, coming in, you know, giant giant flax, if you will. It's not usually, it's not usually good. Um, but yeah, they, I, I haven't really noticed when they show up in spring, but they stick around pretty long uh, before they head south. In fact, uh, what is it? Last year, I had a couple of hummingbirds, the ruby-throated hummingbirds that stuck around right before snow. And apparently that's not too uncommon. No, I, I, I did see a lot of stories about that. Um, I, I couldn't be sure if it was last year or, or the year before, but, uh, I mean, it, it's tempting to speculate that maybe the changing climate is meaning that their patterns of movement uh, are changing and, you know, perhaps they're breeding a little bit further north than they than they had before. Who, who knows? We'll need to look into that, but... Yeah, uh, we have we have had milder winters, so who knows? I mean, they know better than we do. That's right. And if I guess if the food is around, um, mm -hmm. why why travel thousands of kilometers if you <laughs> don't need to? Right, um, all by yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell tell me about that. At, do are they solitary birds in the garden, or are they are they visiting in pairs or groups? Can you determine that from what you've been observing at your feeders? Yeah, well, I can tell you what I observe, and that is usually one or two at the most. Um, and if it's more than one, then they're they're either playing or they're fighting with one another. Well, I take that back because I've seen it recently where they're sort of flying at each other and stuff. Um, this late in the season, you know, I don't think it's like a territorial sort of thing, um, but... Yeah, I I don't get hordes of them here, and they, and and they're just trying to get fat, aren't they? That they're, they're they're trying so they it's competition for access to the trough, really. Yeah, but there's like four ports. It's like, yeah. <laughs> come on, guys, can't you share? Yeah, but the grass is always greener, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And um, I had actually recently came across some heated nectar feeders, so that you can, you know, have them in your yard in the wintertime without the nectar freezing. Um, now, now that, my first thought when I hear about that, and I actually had seen some ads popping up on the, uh, you know, on my web pages while I'm browsing uh, for those. Uh, God knows why anyone would think I would want 
want them, but um, <laughs> Google knows more about me than I do, obviously. <laughs> they know better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are, are there ethical issues about introducing a feeder like that that can inc- that may- maybe not the purpose of it is to change the bird's behaviour, but that could be the effect of it, couldn't it? Well, experts say birds know when to leave. They, you know, they have their internal clock and their um, their own ways of knowing when when to go and when to come back. So, I don't think I wouldn't worry about that. I I don't think that's a concern. Um, you know, I I often hear my audience wondering about uh, how long should I keep up the hummingbird feeder, or, or you know, should I feed them in the summer? Should I, you know, this, that, or the other? And um, really, the bottom line is. Birds, birds are perfectly fine without us feeding them <laughs> year round, every season, anytime. Um, it's kind of uh, more or less a selfish thing we do just so we can get them up close, see them up close and enjoy them that way. They don't really rely on us uh, for much. So, yeah, I don't think there's any worry about that. Now, feeding birds here can be a very joyous um, uh, pastime because many of our birds that are really adaptable to and enjoy being in our urban yards, especially if we're giving them little treats, also interact with, with us, like our Australian magpie. They recognise you. They can... You know, we're anthropomorphizing again uh, them, but they do tend to form relationships with people who regularly feed them treats that they like. Mm-hmm. Um, our kookaburras can do that. Uh, our cockatoos can can become very um, familiar with people who regularly interact with them. Um, there's there's probably more. How about uh, with you, Tammy, you've been feeding continuously for 25 years. So have you got some cardinal friends or some <laughs> bunting friends or or the Sadly, sparrows? No. I'm guessing you got sparrows. Oh, yes. The house sparrows love me. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't have, I mean, I have, like, for example, quite a few downy woodpeckers that come. Are they the same ones? I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I don't know how other people do either. I, I suppose there might be a way to dist- distinguish them, but I certainly can't. Um, I don't, I, I know a lot of people really want to, you know, become BFFs with the birds and you'll see videos and things of people like holding them and feeding them and things like that. Um, that's not really my, my jam. I don't, I don't really uh, partake in that. Uh, for one thing, you know, birds are wild animals, um, and I truly believe they need to be left to their own devices, with the exception, of course, an occasional treat from the feeder. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any regular ones. But you know, I like to think that when the red northern cardinal visits, that it's you know somebody I know, or <laughs> that's always fun. Uh, I'll I'll try after. Um... After we do all the processing and all that of the of the video, the boring part, um, I'll try and include some uh, some you know clips from YouTube or whatever of of the Australian magpies here uh, that they get impatient, so they'll come up to your back door and knock and you know, come on, it's time. <laughs> uh, the local cockatoos here that I fed during the lockdowns. Uh, if I hadn't got out there and, and distributed the seed in the park, which is how I was feeding, so that they were still foraging on the ground and whatnot, uh, they would they knew my place. They would come and sit on the fence outside my front door and <laughs> and tell me. Oh, so I, I stopped feeding because the flock grew to, you know, sort of 30, <laughs> 30 big cockatoos and fifty corellas of two oh my types gosh. and and galahs. And they were they're raucous, and I live in a unit um, with lots of close neighbours. I was upsetting a, a lot of people loved it, but a lot of people hated it too. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> um, not everyone's so, a bird person, right? 
Yeah, and so I stopped feeding, but we're now in that um, uh, period where there's young around and a couple of the pairs of of the both cockatoos and corellas are visiting each day and sitting on the power line where they used to to see if I was going to be feeding them. So um, <laughs> they're clever birds, and that's nearly two years. Uh, yeah, getting on to two years since I sort of stopped regularly feeding them. So hmm. they are... Um, they're very smart, whether yeah. they be big birds or little birds. They know it only took them a couple of days, you said, to find your feeder, mm-hmm. and now it's a you know the the best restaurant in town for twenty five years, <laughs> except for summer. <laughs> yeah, but you if, if, if I'll pose a question about once you once you begin feeding them, you know perhaps the the local population rely on perhaps not your feeder, but that regular abundance of food so that if they can't find what they need elsewhere, they can rely on you. Do you ever mm-hmm. think about that? Like if you were to go on a on an extended holiday and, and protect it, if it was a drought year, for instance, do you mm-hmm. worry about um, ever withdrawing the feed? I don't. Like I said before, I they have the innate ability to find food, um, you know, whether it's seed from a bag or if it's a seed from a flower. Um, they might have to look a little harder, and that's that's one of the reasons I like to feed in winter is um, to help them kind of conserve energy, especially when it's super frigid out. Mm. Um, I know a lot of birds don't make it through the winter for that reason, so. Um, that's kind of why I kind of like to help them out in the in the winter time. But no, I, I I just don't think there's much risk of you know birds going hungry because you're withholding seed for a while. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I feel. What do you think? Um, well, the reason I the reason I ask the question and I talk about it is I'm a little bit conflicted um, mm-hmm. about it. Um, I don't. I don't criticise anybody who wants to feed. What I would then want to do is encourage people to feed the right things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have issues with our parrots here with the parrot beak and feather, feather disease virus. So if you're feeding parrots and cockatoos, you, it, it means that our bird people, you know, people like me who talk about birds all the time need to always be communicating that you need to keep your feeders clean. Mm-hmm. And now we've got avian influenza sweeping through parts of the Northern Hemisphere. So then there is a question that um, do you actually want birds in close quarters, you know, like... Um, uh, so there, so there, are, there are things to consider, mm-hmm. but... But we, want, but we don't want people. What, what's his Sorry about that. That's all right. I've got a dog here too. That's Dash. Apparently, the Amazon man is here. I'm sorry oh, about Dash. that. That's all right. Um, uh, does Dash ever um, make an appearance on your on on your show? I didn't see him in the blog anyway. So. No, no, he does yeah. not make an appearance. In fact, I'm going to zip out real quick and just set him straight. Be right back. Oh, and, you might have to give the Amazon man a, a, a drink of water too. It's hot, <laughs> isn't it? So. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful thing about live. You never know what's going to happen. Um, actually, that gives me an opportunity to um, uh, to set up the next one. There we are. Well, I had a stern conversation with him, and he will not be bothering us again. So, ah, <laughs> uh, look. What? Well, well, uh, and another good thing about the pandemic is so again we're, we're having to to really reach to find anything positive to say about uh, one of the greatest disasters for the health of humanity in the last hundred years mm-hmm. uh, has been that people are a lot more relaxed about doing stuff like what we're doing now live streaming from around the world zoom those endless zoom meetings and and whatnot <laughs> have certainly meant. Oh, I've just got to go and um, you know, <laughs> do something. I've just got to put 
put the kids in a different room or no one really really cares anymore <laughs> so I, I do thank goodness for that yeah i do like that now, now yeah we were just talking about those sort of some of those ethical uh issues but yeah mm-hmm. I, I think about them um but uh, i give you a pass tammy because because i know that you are in tune with with the idea that your backyard is not an island, right? It exists within the framework of the neighbourhood mm-hmm. um, and the the parks that are nearby and then the forests that are further afield and it's a port of call along a journey. So you've, over, over time, you've understood that the plants are the important things to have around as much as the feeder. Mm-hmm. So when did you sort of start to understand that um, local plants are what you need to start thinking about planting mm-hmm. rather than just whatever um, took your fancy at the garden centre? Yeah, well, I... Just from observing birds in my own yard, um, you know, they, you can always find them in the shrubs or the trees. Um, And the reason that I set out to really better understand what attracts birds in terms of plants and flowers and whatnot is there's quite a few people that want to enjoy birds in their yard, but for whatever reason, aren't interested in a bird feeder. Um, some may be concerned that it, you know, attracts rats or raccoons or even squirrels that they don't want in the yard. So I think it's it's valid uh, for people to to know that there's alternative ways that you can help the birds. So not only do you get to enjoy them close up in your yard, but they are literally in their habitat and you know, eating the berries from uh, from the vines or from the berry producing shrubs. Um, and then of course, providing a nesting place for them as well. Um, I know in my yard, I have, uh, I have a lilac bush that for two years in a row, Northern Cardinals have nested in that bush. And I know it's because it's extremely dense um, and, you know, real leafy. And I mean, I had a hard time finding the nest in there myself, um, but I saw them coming and going. So I knew it was in there. So there's just a variety of ways that we can help birds that, that don't even involve on the feeder. <laughs> um, did, when did you sort of become aware um, over that time of 25 years that often people will ask me, I'm, I'm a horticulturist as, as well as a bird nerd, um, Tammy, so people will ask me, what should I plant for a particular bird? And they'll go, I want a seed, a seed eater, or I want flowers to attract the hummingbirds, uh, or here, the, the honey eaters. Um, uh, a lot of people find it very difficult to to move away from I just want the flower or I just want the seed. But what we need, because most birds, even our honey eaters, um, if they are, and lorikeets, the nectar nectar feeding parrots, they also need seed and they also will browse insects and they will also eat the roots and tubers of plants. So Mm -hmm. you need to be thinking about flowers for butterflies, Mm -hmm. flowers for flies, beetles, um, things that caterpillars will eat, all the whole suite of plants. When did you break out of the, I need some flowers or I need some seeds into (laughs) thinking about that whole suite of plants that you need to create um, habitat? That's the word. We need to create habitat for the birds in our gardens. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say it was 20 years ago, but it really has only been recently, uh, in recent years, honestly. Um, But it's, and that's one of the advantages of doing what I do on my blog is 
um, I learn new things every day and I get to research things so that I can compile it in a uh, easily digestible format for my audience. And that was one of the things I had come across. Um, so I'm really on this mission to try and, you know, replace plants in my yard, you know, some of the landscaping plants that are, you know, big giant flowers, um, you know, beautiful for the season or whatever, um, and replace them with more natural um, native plants. Um, so that it does attract the insects because birds do eat insects. Um, and of course the pollinators and um, I, I'm constantly amazed at what, what birds will eat. You know, I, <laughs> as an example, not that long ago, I observed a hummingbird. So I have these hostas. Do you guys have hostas over there? Yes. Um, okay. they're, um, they're not, they're not native, but they're um, frequently used. I mean, mm -hmm. for people who don't know, they're an, a, a great shade, shade loving understory plant with a, mm -hmm. uh, with a flower, but with a big glossy green leaf. Uh, they're kind of like a, uh, I like to think of them of, of a cross between a cyclamen, a violet and an orchid. That's a, and, and perhaps, um, and perhaps a hellebore thrown in, but yeah, there are, um, there are, there are, they or, or a, they're almost like a lily in a way, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's probably another way to think about, but they don't look too lilyish but yeah we yeah. do H hostas are, are a popular plant uh for people with traditional style gardens cottage mm -hmm. gardens but they're yeah. really good for a shady location yeah they're pretty popular around here we have quite a few different uh varieties of them but uh one day i was noticing um so there's this flower that shoots up out of i don't know if it's every hosta spe species or this particular one that i have um, but it's like this, this stiff stem and then like a purple flower comes out. Yeah. I always cut that stem off because I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is ruining my landscape. I'm just, uh, I'm just cutting it off. Um, well, one year I didn't have time to do that. And a hummingbird was sipping nectar from it. Yeah. And I had no idea. Um, I also had no idea that they actually sip nectar, nectar from asters which are you know a popular fall fall blooming uh plant in this area which are a daisy a, a member of the daisy family mm -hmm. yeah it's one of the few plants that actually blooms um in these parts in fall so they're pretty popular um but yeah i had no idea so i just think it's great that i get to learn uh learn more and more every day i learn new different more stuff that i share well, hostas can be important for uh, butterflies and even moths as well. So, um, I will uh, not snip snip those stems anymore. <laughs> or, or if you don't like the purple one, go and find some white ones or something. Yeah, so, there you um, go. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, that, I'm, I'm really aware, Tammy, of the aesthetic um, inclinations of people in their gardens and the utility that gardens need to provide for people. So, um, you know, and there are aspects of design that, that people always want to uh, uh, maintain or create. So the, the great thing is there are millions and millions of types of plants. So you can nearly always find a plant that will do what you want it to do but can also provide some habitat for a lizard, for a frog, for a bird, for a mm -hmm. beetle, for a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's great. Get into it, right. people. Um, <laughs> and you've got a really useful the re – well, I was just scrolling through on Tammy's website, which we'll plug now, onthefeeder.com. Uh, that's one of the recent articles, which is mm -hmm. really one of the reasons why I reached out to uh, – out to Tammy because I see so many things about feeding birds and people trying to flog bird feeders. Buy this. This is the best thing to buy. But your approach has shifted to um, making the feeder uh, an add-on to the local environment 
which mm-hmm. is what the birds need. Once they need, once they leave your yard, they need. If there's no feeders, they need the the an adequate number of mm-hmm. desirable plants. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, yeah. And I earlier you had mentioned, um, you know, disease and the uh, avian flu and whatnot. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, is really my mission is to teach people responsible backyard birding. Um, it's not just, you know, hang a wood feeder out there and let it go for five years. <laughs> I I can't tell you how many photos, uh, you know, amateur backyard people taking pictures of photos where I see their bird feeder and it is atrocious. It is just moldy and filthy. Of and, disrepair. Yep. Yeah. And um, they really need to be clean. They, I mean, you need to clean your feeder like you maybe not as much as you wash your own dishes, but think of it that way. Um, you know, especially since you have a variety of birds and different species all mm-hmm. coming together and, yeah. you know, all it takes is one, one to be sick to spread it. So. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you reiterated that because that is one of the really important things that if you, it, it it's like owning a pet, you need to be responsible if you're owning a pet and you need mm-hmm. to be responsible if you are deciding to, um, and uh, and let's be real, you are pushing yourself into the lives of native uh, of wild creatures if you are feeding, mm-hmm. and you need to do it in a way that doesn't harm them. And, yes. Uh, and look, we, there's a debate often about sunflower seeds in Australia. Cockatoos, particularly, and all the para, the lorikeets, they need a balanced diet. They they are nectar feeders, but they also browse seed and eat roots and whatnot. But they will all prefer sunflower seed. And sunflower mm. seeds make our native birds obese, mm. which cuts down their ability to survive. Like if you withdraw the food and then they've got to rapidly move to somewhere else, their ability to compete becomes less in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so vary the food don't uh, mm-hmm. I, I actually withdrew sunflower um, black sunflower seed mm-hmm. and went to gray striped sunflower seed mm-hmm. in a very small proportion so they have to work harder to mm-hmm. get their their treat they all prefer it mm-hmm. but just it's <laughs> like feeding people you know you don't you don't come to dinner at Tammy's place and the only thing that she ever feeds you is <laughs> is, is a cheesecake, not a slice of cheesecake. But My husband cheesecake. would like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, w- but would he like it every day and never have anything else? That's kind of what happens if you only put out one kind of feed. Right, um, yeah. And that's another reason I like uh, platform feeders is, you know, I, I throw a handful of food out there like including all the variety, one handful of food that includes stripes, sunflower seeds, black oil, safflower, uh, maybe some suet chunks or whatever. And when it's gone, it's gone. It's not like a steady flow of seed that just eat it till it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, well that, that, that's sort of preferable to, to my mind. And I'm, I'm not against it when people are using hopper feeders and things like that, but, mm-hmm. but it, that's kind of like going to the McDonald's drive through I reckon. Whereas, uh, whereas when you're using a tray feeder and you're using an assortment of different foods, mm-hmm. that's a bit like going to the classy restaurant. That's like going out on a proper date, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I don't know whether you do it, but something I encourage people to do over here is when you're cleaning up the garden and you're weeding or whatever, you want most of that to go into the compost, but where there's little tender shoots and like I basically say chop off all the tops of of your weeds and put those on the feeder because hmm. birds will utilize that stuff. Wow. Right? Um and <laughs> mine and so, blown. I never would have thought of that. <laughs> no, well well all, all those immature all the fruits that haven't developed properly, that mm-hmm. the seed heads that haven't opened, all those kind of things, birds will still eat them. Mm-hmm. Um uh I don't know which fills the sort of niche that our ground grass parrots, our ground feeding parrots, like 
Lorik, uh, Rosellas and and we did a, uh, a show the other day on the red rump parrot. That's what they like. They they go and get all those seed heads before they've opened up, hmm. before the. You, know, you mentioned earlier thistles. Uh, mm-hmm. Or the there's certain birds will come and eat the thistle seeds as they're dispersing. I think sparrows probably uh, will be picking those kind of things. Well, the grass parrots get in there before they've um, developed. They get them when they're green and fleshy, but they've oh. still got all the nutrients in them. So, okay. Um, yeah. The finches love the thistle. Um, in fact, late fall, early winter, I, I see quite a few goldfinch, you know, perched on a rudbeckia plant or something. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll have to pick them and throw them in the feeder, see what happens. Yeah, well, you get them just before they're about to disperse. And uh, oh. um, Now, I, I, there's no doubt going to be a bird that that will f- fill that niche, that mm-hmm. ecological niche um, in there. I don't know, perhaps it would be cardinals or waxbills or something. I don't know, but... Um, uh, yeah, I just I just don't know enough about your your birds to to uh, to, to say, but there will be a bird that ex- exploits that food reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, just do it. But they all need a varied diet, you know. It's like you, yeah, you, 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 even if your kid only likes potatoes, you've got to make sure that they sometimes eat something that's green or <laughs> uh, or red, you know. Yeah, um, right. Uh, yeah, so but. Birds are no different. So, tell me, Tammy, what has your feeding uh, experience led you to do? You mentioned the blog, so let's talk about the development of the blog and mm-hmm. how you've started being a source of information for other people. Yeah, again, by accident, mostly. <laughs> um, I spent most of my career in corporate America as an analyst. And, um, you know, it, times change, you reach a point in your life, where you're like, Oh, I want to do something different. I want So I, I, I went back to school, and I learned web design, uh, which I love, but I didn't want to do that as a career. So I began exploring other ways I can, um, you know, provide for my family, and thoroughly enjoy it. And I stumbled uh, across blogging and uh, when I was brainstorming ways, different niches or different topics to write about, it was obvious. It was like so obvious um, that I would write about backyard birds and, you know, haven't looked back yet. It's just like I mentioned before, every day is something new, Um, you know, new studies coming out, new things that we're learning and yeah, so that's like I said by accident. When did you actually launch the blog, Tammy? Um, what is? Oh, this is September, so it was a year ago May. So it's about a year and a half, roughly. Okay, and and mm-hmm. you're obviously checking out your analytics and whatnot. So who who's coming? Who's coming to onthefeeder dot com and? Um, and consuming your articles and what i'm i'm interested in what you what you like to write about um this is something that when you produce like a podcast like like i do or if you are blogging Mm -hmm. um do you do you sort of follow the trends or do you just do what you want or does the audience ask you to cover things Kind of a mixture of all three. Um, you know, if it if if you want it to be sustainable, you have to write about what people are asking about. Um, and as all bloggers know, there's you know there's ways to find out what people are asking through Google. So I, I focus on that quite a bit. Um, I don't really have a direct line to my audience at this point. Uh, I I plan to in the future. There's just so much I still have to do. Uh, So I really haven't embarked on that yet. But just by participating in Facebook groups and, um, you know, Quora forums and whatnot, um, I got a pretty good sense of what people 
people want to know and what they're interested in. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the primary source of the articles that I write. Um, and like I said, I, I'll sit down and write the article to the best of my personal experience and knowledge. And what I don't know, I will research. And, you know, I'll go to uh, allaboutbirds.org, which is part of the Cornell Cornell University Ornithology Lab. Um, Audubon chapters, um, you know, just really scientific type of sources to fill in the gaps. So um, it's a lot of fun. I, I just, I just can't express enough how much, how much fun it is. It doesn't feel like work. It's not really work to me. So are you now able to say you are just a blogger and, and I don't mean just a blogger, <laughs> just. but, but that, but that you are exclusively a blogger and that you're not having to do commercial web design to, on the site? Yes. I am just a blogger. Uh, uh, <laughs> I am a blogger. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. That, that is really, really, really good. Yeah. Um, you're, I mean, it's a massive, it's a massive um, audience of people who want to feed birds now in the in the U.S. and Canada, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Most of my traffic comes from the U.S. Um, um, next would be uh, Canada. Um, I don't really write about U.K. birds other than the ones are, that are from the U.K. <laughs> yeah, that move that move over. Yeah, the, yeah, the European ones. Um, so that's really my focus at this time. Uh, who knows? I may expand in the future, but yeah, it's in terms of demographics. I don't have any hard evidence on who it is, uh, um, you know, age-wise um, that are visiting. But I kind of have a good good idea. Well, I, I, good sense. Are you looking at your Google Analytics to find to find that out? Uh, it do, what I'm looking at doesn't give me that level of detail. Age. Oh age stuff so um i don't know maybe like i said i have so much to do on the website that's probably an area i need to explore further oh we we, we should talk <laughs> we should talk um it's it it can be really surprising when you dig into the analytics to find out oh. who 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 is listening it's it's often not who you think or, yeah. or reading it's very often not who you think it is which, yeah um, i should not assume should i um, well, it, it, it's another one of the great things I think about the development of technology is that we mm -hmm. can more specifically, um, uh, I don't go, I don't go out to find an audience. Like it's not like that kind of marketing where you door to door sales and all that, where you're wanting to bash into people's lives, <laughs> but the people who find you is what. I find is really interesting and then that you can then extend what you talk about or that you write about to mm -hmm. um, to feed them and to feed people like them and to, you know, it's a cliche, but to, to build your tribe, it's a, it, it, it's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I didn't check actually. I should have brought up the other window. Are you running a store out of the uh, out of the site as well? No. No. Good on you. Good on you. No. Um, that um, that would really take my focus off of what I'm trying to do. I think that sounds like a huge undertaking. <laughs> Actually, how how often are you publishing? Are you writing one article a week, or are, are you on a schedule? Like, are you that disciplined? I have a schedule. I don't always stick to it. <laughs> um, best laid plans, right? Um, I would say average, it waxes and wanes. It's like sometimes I'm just like really motivated and I'll publish six articles in a week and sometimes I'll publish two a month. You know what I mean? It's just... Yeah, yeah. I do know what you mean. <laughs> uh, and I, I try to keep it light because I don't want it... I want it to always be fun. If it starts feeling like a job, then it's not going to be fun anymore. So um, that's kind of my my take on it. Yeah, it's um, it's one of the benefits of doing things about birds and about nature and wildlife. It's um, uh, 
it's it's a lot easier to be uh, productive without feeling like you are slogging it out in the nine in the nine to five because <laughs> because how can you get sick of learning about the the things around us? It's uh, no, I, it's right? Not possible, right? It's not possible. <laughs> um, Tammy, have you got a favourite bird that um, comes to your feeder? Yeah, I guess it would have to be the northern cardinal. And it, have you determined that the northern cardinal has a particular um, character or um, character strengths or flaws? <laughs> Do they play nice with others? They're they're kind of a shy bird, actually, and I'm kind of shy too. So maybe that's why. I kind of relate to them, but, um, you know, that the male Northern Cardinal, everybody loves his bright red color. Um, especially in winter time is pretty cool to see against a backdrop of snow, but the female Cardinal is in my opinion, equally beautiful, if not more, because she just, she just has a variety of colors and they both have that bright orange, uh, beak and, I can't explain it. It's, it's just, I mean, I get excited when I see birds in general, but either the male or the female Northern Cardinal, it never gets old. And they're in my yard all the time. It just never gets old. Do, do they establish a territory? Like a, a, have you got a pair of Northern Cardinals that come mm -hmm. to your feeder or do you get groups of them coming in? Yeah, I think uh, in the spring and summer, they are uh, very territorial. You know, they're nesting and raising their young and whatnot. Um, and in that time frame, I have a pair that visits. But in the winter time, you know, all bets are off. They're they're all, you know, territory lines kind of uh, diminish. Okay. And yeah, yeah. So there's nothing cooler than seeing several male cardinals against a backdrop of snow. <laughs> Sometimes it's the only yeah. way I, that I survive winter is just <laughs> seeing the Cardinals. To give listeners in, uh, in Australia and other temperate parts of the world an idea, how tough is your winter? How cold does it get? And actually I'll have to get the, um, I'll, I'll have to get the um, uh, change her over a thing because you're going to tell me in Fahrenheit, aren't you? Yeah, that's all I know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see. I would say that the temperatures range between, let's say, 35 on a warm day and can get below zero. I mean, when the wind starts whipping, we we get below zero temps, um, 50 below. Um, 50 below. I mean, that's not real common, but it has happened. <laughs> it's like you, you you don't leave the house you take the dog out and you just you run out there and you run back and yeah okay be, um bear with me while i um convert uh, yeah uh, <laughs> uh oh that's no that's 50 um To give people an idea, it, it hasn't told me the minus. If I put that in, there we go. Um, uh, that can't be right. Um, okay, so 50, 50, not minus 50, is about 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, but minus 50 is minus 45 Celsius. I can't even, I can't even relate to that. The huh. coldest it gets in my yard, uh, and it hasn't been anywhere near it this year, but a couple of years ago we were getting minus three, which for you would be about 27 Fahrenheit. Mm. So that's that's almost tropical, isn't it, for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, us Wisconsinites, we'll be out there in our sweatshirts maybe. Um <laughs> Yeah. Right, well, let, let let me tell you about what we've regularly been get, been getting in summer, which is coming up to us. Uh, yeah, it's not unusual now for us to get forty five in summer, maybe four or five, six days a year. 
Um, so that's 113, 114 in your oh my gosh in your numbers. Now that they used to be very, very rare. A, a hot day for us, actually. I don't know if this is interesting for anyone else, but it, a really hot day for us would have been 38 degrees 10 years ago. That would have been 100, 100.4. That was a that was a rare like you know, and 35, which would be I don't know what 96 or something maybe. Oh. That was when people were starting <laughs> to really complain that it was hot, and some industries would stop outdoor work and whatnot. But uh, don't think we got any last summer, but mm-hmm. in in the extreme summers, 40, that's hard. I, well, over over forty, we get a couple each year, and to get really extreme heat days are not not unheard of anymore. Um, I think again the shifting climate, uh, mm-hmm. and yeah, that is that is hot, and that's when I think bird feeding becomes really important because that's when the plants in our gardens are burning off and dying mm. which means the f- the flowers and the fruit six months down the track are not happening because the development on those plants has stopped so everything gets interrupted and that's when mm. supplementary feeding in residential areas I think becomes something we all need to think about and of course if you're putting feed out you need to be putting water out yeah, we haven't talked about that. water, but yeah, water is yeah. huge. I yeah. uh, and and it, that's actually more important, and that's mm-hmm. where the ethical issues about maintaining it and withdrawing it mm-hmm. come into it, because birds can always go somewhere else to find some feed, because plants will be still there. Mm-hmm. But if they are relying on your water source and it goes away, that's a whole different story. You can't assume in summer that there is lots of water out there there might be some but it might not be enough to maintain the population that is built up around it Mm -hmm. so that is one of the considerations so how do you how do you water your birds (laughs) um i have several bird baths in the area um and or around my yard i should say and i fill them every day and i scrub them clean at least once a week um you know, for those, for those days that where it gets, it gets really, really hot and, you know, mold starts to form or just other birds fly over and, you know, stuff falls out of the sky. I mean, you got to keep them clean. So it's just, um, it's just, it's another kind of clever way that you can help them, but then, you'll see species that come up close to you that wouldn't visit a feeder or wouldn't normally come into your yard. So that's kind of cool too. Yeah. Um, Just on water, Tammy, I might throw this out there because a lot of people worry about having a dish or a bowl out there. Um, And I sort of agree it can be a lot of work and whatnot. And you've got to maintain if they're too deep, the mm-hmm. little birds won't use them. If they're too shallow, the big birds don't use them. So a lot of things to consider. But you can vary it mm-hmm. by having a little shallow depression in your garden that you can turn into a soak. And you can, I mean, the, the, the equipment to do it is really easy now. You can get a bit of that um, soaker hose. Mm-hmm. Um, main, what do they call it, drippies or something over here. Mm-hmm. So all you need to do is is put that into a circle and uh, put a tea, little tea connection there and run that back to, um, back to either a timer or to a tap that you only slightly open. What do you guys call it? A spigot, don't you? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you can bury that in a depression in the ground and that can become a continual source of water without using lots and lots of water on your water Mm -hmm. bill. The other thing is just one of those drippers. You can just run a hose to a little emitter, that Hmm. really low rate emitter, and maybe with with a tray, and then you don't have to remember to go and clean it. And if you put, um, if you have it so that it can run out when it's over full, um, Birds can still use it without it getting stagnant. So there's a whole lot of little tricks that mean when you go on vacation, you can still have water for the birds. And that's yeah. that's something that I 
I really like to push because um, people do go away for a month in summer, don't they? If they if they have the means in, in I've heard in of people. Of yeah, yeah. No, it's um, uh, it's really cultural here that a lot of people will just disappear. We everyone takes a um, December and a lot of January. Sometimes hmm. people are gone for all of January, the hottest part of the year. Um, so if they spend, you know, 10 months of the year feeding the birds and building up their local population and then all of a sudden the water disappears, mm-hmm. um, we can't assume. I mean, if everyone in your suburb or if 20% of the people in your suburb have gone on holidays and stopped watering their birds, mm-hmm. well, they've all got to go somewhere. And then the competition comes up for water and all. all so it's just easy, just have a dripper, or you yeah. can have a hopper. You know, you can have one of those big hoppers in a little dispensary and, um, yeah, lots of opportunities. Yeah, th- so, those are some clever ideas and um, maybe a topic for my next article. <laughs> oh, well, maybe, well, um, uh, Tammy, I'm, I can almost make an announcement here. I'm, I'm going to start another channel. I'm not going to start another podcast, but I am going to start another YouTube uh, channel and whatnot, and that's all about habitat gardening. So awesome! Um, and obviously, my skills are in Australia, but I'm really interested to extend the um, the information that's out there for um, well for every every zone in the world. I'd like I'd like to be able to talk to people from everywhere. So I'd probably like to talk to you again, Tammy, about you know how you're using the Audubon or Audubon. Uh, regional lists and, 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 and <laughs> I'd love it yeah yeah because uh, it's a it, it's it's a real extension of uh, of the argument because once you start look start feeding birds if you if you aren't already but bear all the things in mind about <laughs> what are the what are the best practices now I know when I was reading uh, reading your blog last week you you uh, You'd mentioned about the kind of birds that you want to discourage in some instances when you're feeding and when you're designing and planting mm-hmm. a garden for birds or garden for wildlife. Mm-hmm. Who are the pesky, pesky ones in uh, in your location that you really try not to attract? Uh, in my experience, it is the house sparrows. Um and primarily because um, I have some eastern bluebird houses in the yard, and you know, the the house sparrows are notoriously super aggressive um, for cavities um, for nesting and raising their young. Um, and I I just I just want to be able to peacefully raise some eastern bluebird babies in my yard. But it's nature, it's wildlife, and it's just sort of a selfish thing on my part. Um, yeah, there, I feel like they, the house sparrows outnumber. There's just so many of them, and and introduced invasive species. So sometimes mm-hmm. the term nature and wildlife are not actually really applicable. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, well, they probably would have found their way to North America. Anyway, you, you would you would think they are so adaptable, yeah. Um, but then that's one of the issues about they exploit the tray feeder. Um, I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but in my experience, if you put out a flat surface and seed, and you have a small flock of house sparrows nearby, they will they will come to own that that tray. <laughs> They're yeah, and they'll clean it out. Yeah, they'll yeah, clean it yeah. out. Yeah, they clean it out, and then they'll, and if they don't, they will, um, oh, they'll dominate bigger birds, won't they? They're, they can be very aggressive as a group. They can, yeah, they are very aggressive, and um, you know, I've heard a lot of horror stories. I've not experienced it myself, where, you know, house sparrows have, um, let's just say, demolished an entire bluebird family in their cavity, um, but again, that's nature. And yeah. I don't know, I, I sometimes, I know a lot of people want to help the birds. Um, I don't feel it's their place to really intervene 
and thing you know of course it's totally illegal if it's a native bird not a not a non-native yeah. bird but um yeah i i don't know they're not my favorite <laughs> um, th there's a whole other range of uh, of issues to consider when it comes to offering nesting opportunities for birds um mm -hmm. it's been a regular topic on on my show about providing artificial hollows and artificial opportunities for nesting now you don't have to destroy existing nests if they're there although in like for noxious species in in uh, in some states here you are obliged to if you know they're there mm -hmm. um, but you can discourage some species from nesting you can mm -hmm. uh, there are pre preferred ways to um, provide opportunity for native birds all over the place so maybe that's another thing we can explore because I know very little about what's going on in the uh, in the US and northern hemisphere northern hemisphere about nesting <laughs> so that could be another opportunity to collaborate down the track, yeah Tammy. yeah that's a whole topic in and of itself I and there's people on both sides of the fence that are very passionate about it. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think there's ever a absolute um, answer, mm -hmm. um, but there, I, I always lean on the side that if you have a declining um, population of native birds for a particular species, and you can prefer them and discourage the other competitors, well, then that seems like a sensible thing to do. But I always defer to the experts. That's why I, <laughs> I, I like to I like to interview the ecologists and the biologists and, right. and whatnot, and 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 find out what what they what their take is. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. Yeah, and and then we just try and uh, adapt it into the way we're living our lives in our particular location. Mm -hmm. To give the birds a chance. That's um, right, Tammy. Before we um, before we wind up, uh, is bird strike something that you have started to think about, um, in, both at your place, but also mm -hmm. in your communicating um, the issues for people yeah. who are feeding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually. Um one of my earlier articles was about, um, you know, people are wondering why, why are Cardinals uh, bashing against my window? You know, what, what's going on there? And in that particular case, it's usually because it's mating season. Um, they're very aggressive. You know, they're, they're trying to keep their female bird away from the other males and whatnot. And they see the reflection in the mirror or in the window, I should say. And, think it's another bird and actually start fighting it so that's what's going on in some cases um, in other cases it's they see the rest of the world reflection in the window and don't realize until they fly into it that it's right. in, in fact a window um, so yeah it is it, it's a big deal and um, I just try to educate people on placement of feeders and uh, the use of uh, bird deterring sort of window decals and things like that. Um, and interesting timing because I'm in the process of revisiting my article. Um, I've actually reached out to an expert, Dr. Clem. I don't know if you've heard of him. I have. And, yeah. and well, well, you've got a, a almost neighbor who is a, who is an expert too um, in the, uh... Uh, Heidi Trudell, who has been um, researching and and helping alleviate this problem with with the prof with the designers and the uh, and the builders. Um, oh, now, okay. Um, you can find Heidi on Twitter at Just Save Birds. Mm. Um, there's also a book. I don't know if it's out. I've got a review copy that I've got to talk about, which is called Solid Air. Mm. Um, which is about the concept of the, the migrating birds that um, they don't see the glass. And mm -hmm. uh, we lose a billion birds a year on your flyway alone, I think. 
a billion, Mine? not a million. <laughs> yeah. My personal uh, flyway? Well, the, 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 the North American <laughs> flyway. Sure. Um, so that's a billion. Yeah. And and it's estimated from the studies that are done that one third of those are colliding not with skyscrapers and big glassy commercial buildings, which everyone thinks are the problem, but one third of those are colliding with just the windows in your backyard, your shed window. Mm-hmm. And and you don't find the bird because it collides, it falls to the ground, it's okay enough to fly away, mm-hmm. but it's got a concussion and it dies somewhere else. Right. And so that's how big the – that's every year. So yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a that's, huge concern of mine. And that's – that's 300 million birds a year are smashing into windows in people's mm. yards. Yeah. Yeah, I I am worried about that. It is a concern of mine. And um, like I said, I reached out to Dr. Clem, and I'm in the process of updating my article because there is information that would need to change based on the research that he's done. Um, in particular, distant, you know, feeder distances from windows. Um so yeah, I, I'm working on that. I'll, I'll I'll have to chase him up because there's some there's some information out there that basically says there are no safe windows. It it just and and unless unless we go back to the days of shutters and 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 awnings and whatnot over all of our windows, which doesn't mm. suit our design aesthetic, mm-hmm. but there there is no safe big um, open glass, um, surface. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe, I believe that, you know, as it relates to backyard bird feeding, I believe that he had said, if your feeders are within three feet of the window. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's what it has to be that basically they are so close that the birds cannot get, uh, uh, get up enough speed Mm -hmm. before they collide, Mm -hmm. um, to, to make it a a, a, a totally incapacitating in, injury, right? Um, and exactly, uh, yeah. But it's it's not usually the um, it's not usually the birds leaving bird feeders that are that suffer from strike. It's just the birds that are traversing through the neighbourhood um, oh. that, from certain angles, they just cannot see glass. Okay. And, um, yeah, and that's. Yeah, massive issue, which is why plants are really useful. You plant them strategically and they make birds change course if they're mm-hmm. going through on a, yeah. on a direct route through your yard. Um, yeah, see, I, I'm learning new things all the time. And that was one thing that crossed my path recently um, was, you know, the, this actual research that was done on the bird strikes. So very concerning. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll pop down here under uh, under our interview or on on this page. I'll put all the links that I can find, and I'll put Dr. Clem in there. I'll also, of course, be linking over to Tammy, and I'll let Tammy know uh, all the links, and perhaps she can um, uh, follow them up for her for her blog because it's uh, it's been an invisible issue, but this mm-hmm. has been going on since we've started building. Lots, lots of concentrations of buildings that are getting taller, and with lots and lots more glass. You think about the the house your your grandparents uh, would have built their first home, Tammy, and how much glass it had compared mm-hmm. to how much. I've um, never seen your house, but I'm guessing <laughs> that your house has at least two to three times more glass than your grandparents would have had in their Probably. house. Probably. Mm-hmm. And that's that's why the problem is so large uh, mm-hmm. because we are and, – and we're increasing the amount of glass we have in our domestic homes. I mean, well, when I was a kid, we're talking the 60s and 70s, not many people had a whole back – yeah, a back wall leading to a patio or a veranda right. that was all glass. You had one sliding door, right? Right. Um, yeah. 
So the pro- it's just a problem that has developed without anybody mm-hmm. really thinking about it. And now we've got to think about retrofitting our homes and our yards if, mm-hmm. if we care, if we actually think it's a problem. Mm-hmm. I think it's a problem. I think a billion birds in one flyway. You then talk about the Asian flyway and the European African flyway, and they're probably losing a billion and another billion. So we're losing three billion birds a, a, a year. So it yeah. doesn't matter how much. I mean, it seems crazy that we spend so much time encouraging them to breed only to kill them. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm hopeful it's a case of. You don't know what you don't know until you know it, right? So yeah. it's a matter of getting the word out. And, um, you know, at a minimum, new construction homes, I understand that there's uh, manufacturers creating a type of glass that solves the problem. Well, um, mi- mitigates, I think, would be the word. Mitigate? I don't, okay. It, it, um, that's astroturfing and greenwashing when they say they solve it. It doesn't solve it. Okay. What, what, what we do is minimize it. And glass alone, and there's also the way we design our homes, and then there's the way that we lay out our suburbs, and then it's that we have taken, we've taken trees out of so many situations, and a lot of that is public safety and all that. You know, nobody wants to have vegetation cover because it's deemed to be, you know, encouraging the ne'er do wells and all that. There's a whole lot of things we've put to, we've all, they've all reached a, a juncture point and it's the birds that are paying the price. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we live in very tidy suburbs now. Very, very tidy. <laughs> Manicured and yeah, yep. Yep. I agree. And that, and, and that's not, uh, they're generally not good for all birds, but they're good for some birds and they're generally the birds that we are trying to discourage Elsewhere, sparrows and sparrows and Indian miners and starlings love those kind of places. Uh, yeah, yeah. Luckily, starlings. It's not, I haven't had an issue with those, but yes, I, I I do know a lot of people that do. And so. how and and how about the rats of the air? Have you got a, a domestic pigeon problem in? Uh... uh not in my yard. I, I don't have a lot of mature trees in my yard. Um, they're getting there, but. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do about squirrels. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, you've got the the grey squirrel, haven't you? And of course, that's the uh, that's a massive problem in 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 Britain and Europe. The displacing the red squirrel. Oh, uh, that so that that's the native native squirrel in, uh, in you know it's a big thing in London. Everyone wants to have a red squirrel, but your gray squirrels are the really aggressive ones. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> and, well, no, but, but, but the, this is—it's it's not your fault. It's not the Americans' <laughs> fault. It's not the—it's not the squirrels' fault. Um, mm-hmm. But here in in Australia, uh, when a lot of people call, when New Zealand was growing as a colony, the same people who were colonising Australia colonised New Zealand. Um, we got the British birds here, but then a lot of Australian animals and birds have were taken to New Zealand because people thought, oh, kookaburras are lovely. Let's, uh, you know, uh, hmm. I don't think kookaburras have established in New Zealand, but our rainbow lorikeet is, and it's a super aggressive, hyper-dominant, dom- really, really successful. They're having to put lots of effort into controlling them because... Oh, the New Zealand birds never had a bird like that to mm-hmm. uh, to, can, to contend with. So, yeah, just There's let other nature, issues, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, endless issues, yeah, no shortage. Right. So, so mm-hmm. let's uh, let's encourage the good ones. Do everything we can for for the birds around us, and look, let's just appreciate them. I agree. Appreciate them, mm-hmm. um, uh, dear listener, dear viewers. The uh, on the feeder dot com. I was going to say the on the feeder, but it's no on the feeder dot com. Uh, Tammy's got a delightful way of talking about the birds she sees around her, um, particularly you American North American uh, people, and also you Northern Hemisphere 
bird feeders mm -hmm. will find something of interest there, I'm sure. And the look, we haven't even got to what I wanted to talk about is how to watch the birds in your yard, Tammy. But perhaps we can do that on a different time. I love it. We'll, we'll we'll maybe talk about the binoculars versus <laughs> scopes issue and some of the techniques that you can use to watch birds without disturbing them. Because mm -hmm. that's uh, another another skill we need to learn. Sounds great. Uh, Tammy, stick around after we end. I've got uh, something I want to I want to check out with you. But okay, um, Tammy Poppy, the creator, originator, and lead author I'll give you all those titles Tammy <laughs> to wear um, for onthefeeder.com I'm Grant, I'm a bird nerd this has been The Bird Emergency I look forward to you joining us again and do look out for Habitat Gardening with Grant on the YouTube if you're interested in these issues about plants and birds and wildlife Cheers everyone, bye <laughs>